Computer. Okay, Maria, if you want to get rolling and start us off. Sure. So thank you so much, first of all, Michael and Maureen, for inviting me to this. Um, it's it's really great. The the three of us go way back for the rest of you on the call. We we all met when we were assistant professors and have really grown up through in the field together and uh, um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and really honored that you took this time to um, allow me to talk about my research and the things that I've been thinking about. And so to that point, I'm Maria Dorfel and I'm a professor at Rutgers University. And um, in my uh, career here, I work in the communication uh, department that's nested in a communication information and media school. And um, through that, our small school has social science, humanities slash critical studies, and information science, all working together and thinking about things together. So um, as a network scholar too, my fit to that particular department made a lot of sense and still does today. And so um, at the university, I have a network lab that's um, interdisciplinary with people from sociology management, as well as the my communication department and um, the library and information uh, science people are affiliated with it as well. So we're kind of doing things that are networky. And for those of you who had time to read the articles that um, I shared with Michael, um, those articles kind of give you a sense of how I look at the world. And I just, I just see networks and relationships. And so as we're all living through this pandemic, we, we all know the language of networks now with contact tracing, right? Like, you know, if, you, if you're asked, who did you see in the past week? You know, we're, what we're actually trying to do is tap into and understand your networks. And so don't even get me started with the contact tracing that the US is doing, or at least New Jersey is attempting to do because they have no idea what they're doing. And it does not look like the type of networks that could actually make a difference and help curb the spread of the disease. But anyway, so, um, so I study organizational communication, and I know that so many of you are, and especially because you're affiliated with Maureen and Michael, that you're interested in crisis and public relations aspects of it. And this is part of how the conversation among, um, among Michael, Maureen, and I really started helping us see the liminal boundaries between public relations and organizational communication. And at the intersection of that and the overlap is in social networks. So you see that they have now adopted and taken up some of the language of social networks and actually some of the theoretical and, can, and extending social network theory. And then likewise, I've taken up and started drawing on some of the public relations theory because my level of focus is often at the organization level where the organization is the node in the network right and the relationships among organizations and inter-organizational relationships um is in i think could be seen now as a public relations function in some ways even though i don't necessarily study organizations public relations practices they certainly do build partnerships and relationships with various different organization level stakeholders um, in their broader communities. And in the organization studies area that I've done most of my research in and that I'm most well read in, um, that's what we're looking at is these inter-organizational relationships. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, oh, it's disabled, Michael. Can I second. get access to that? I'm gonna share my screen because I'll, I'll walk through some things and I'm hoping that I can jump back and forth between sharing and not sharing it so we can talk about these types of um, questions and theories that I'm gonna be presenting as well. But actually, um, and before I share my screen, I will say too, that especially given the all of you, almost all of you, I think, are have your hand in some way on crisis. And you know, I, I got a little bit of news. The US is notoriously bad at telling us much about um, other countries, <laughs> um, but we do know about the floods that have been happening in Australia. And, you know, and that kind of disaster event, I do consider 
part of the range of types of crises that organizations face, um, although they are so obviously very different from crises that can directly impact an organization's reputation, um, they still force organizations to pause in their normal day-to-day -day lives and figure out how to reorient and adjust around those things, right? Um, and, and of course, living in this pandemic now, it's the pandemic has given us yet another way to stretch out maybe a continuum of types of crises where a particular crisis and a particular event that affects only one organization is at one end of that continuum. I used to think disasters that impacted entire regions and, and lots of organizations was at the other end of that continuum. Um, however, now pandemics seem to stretch out that continuum a little bit. And I just wonder, especially since we have so many people thinking about crisis communication, where do you, where are you thinking about the pandemic? Do you view it as a crisis? Do you see this as a particular moment that enables um, empirical analysis to be kind of amplified a little bit? Are there particular things that you're doing right now, knowing the pandemic is interrupting? public relations practices as we normally know them? I would say certainly well, yes. I'm just, I guess I'm just gonna jump in. I say I'm, I, I certainly yes. And um, I, I've taken, the, um, it was kind of the, um, the workshop with Dr. Sell now, and we discussed a lot about the nature of the crisis and what's going on uh, at that time. And, and, and we thought of a pandemic as a mega crisis. Mm -hmm. So all other crisis, crisis, they kind of play in, in between, you know, kind of in, in that bigger context. But mm -hmm. one thing that we kind of stumble on and we, we didn't, we, we weren't able to solve. Um, and that's something I was kind of thinking about is that, you know, um, should we consider still crisis as a perception or should we consider crisis as something as a given? Because, you know, we clearly have a pandemic. It's clearly happening. People are clearly dying. Uh, and you know, economy is clearly suffering, but for some people, it's not a crisis because they don't perceive it as a crisis. They don't perceive it as a problem. Well, for some people, it's definitely a crisis, and they do perceive it this way. So, how do we kind of what we were thinking? Like, how do we uh, connect? You know, how do we? Uh, you know, what are we going to do? What are we doing with this? With this gap? With this? With with this um, misfit? between those two and so how are we going to play now with this because mm -hmm. you know from the literature most of the literature we think of crisis as a perception so you know how now it's all changing so it's kind of something some 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 of the things we're thinking about yeah that's fascinating uh Dimitro, did you want to chime in yes i i like very much your 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 idea about the continuum because to my mind pandemic is like as the entry point which which actually uh, opened the door for various crises. Now I'm now I'm consulting uh, the uh, we call it's like analog of uh, your CDC, but with much more limited uh, responsibility. So it calls the Center of Public Health, and now we see that we have a crisis in trust. We have a crisis in institutions because vaccine. We don't have enough vaccines, but even those vaccines we have, we cannot uh, disseminate it properly. Even uh, if we disseminated the vaccine, uh, people that do not, don't want to vaccinate it, even if they want to vaccinate it. Anyway, this chain is not uh, enough to ensure that we will not lose vaccines, even if we don't have. It. So like, right. it's like a, it's a hell. Sometimes. Yeah. And that's really interesting too, the idea that you see the multidimensionality of the pandemic's crisis, right? Like the crisis in institutions and trust in institutions and seeing so much. And the fact that we're really, at least in the United States, we're revealing because it's a news item every day that so much of our scientific knowledge is from big pharma, from pharmaceutical companies that are corporations or privately held and you know and inherently we know from various trust barometers and so forth that the corporations tend to not be have as much trust their reputations tend to not be as stellar as you know like nonprofit organizations right 
And, you know, and the, the fact that there's, I, I find it interesting right now that I'm not hearing how they're, how they're uh, performing the partnerships they have with nonprofits to help them access local communities or to partner with communities and to help bring up their reputations, right? Like, why aren't they helping, uh, you know, uh, helping to, 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 to uh, communicate out that they are partnering with places that enhance their own legitimacy and that we could trust them, right? Or even like the CDC now, you know, it, it, it reveals the multi-levelness too, right? Like it, it sounds like your Center for Health or Disease Control, what, I, I forgot the exact word you called it, but this the analogous CDC there, they, they have not done a good job helping, you know, at least in the US, these 70% of Americans who have not been to college, let alone many who've been to college, but um, but don't necessarily have a great education, <laughs> um, understand that the knowledge that science generates is changes in its dynamic, right? And so people have lost trust in the CDC here because the CDC keeps changing and updating its messages, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but, but our people didn't have trust in our CDC at all. Oh. So the Americans lost the trust, but the Ukrainians didn't gain the trust. That, right. That's, you know, as I say, right. uh, yesterday one woman died after the uh, 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 two days after the vaccination. And right. immediately, you know, next hour, all opposition st start to cry and everything. Vaccines are generated by corporations, vaccines are generated by Chinese, vaccines, oh, sorry, virus, yeah. virus was generated by Chinese, virus was by you Americans, by Russians, by everyone. That's yeah. like, it helped, yeah, yeah, really, you know. Yeah, and so we see too, like in this example, and this frustration is, you know, there's that layer of the, the issues of trust then there's also, to me, again, as the network scholar, I'm thinking about what's missing here in part of the narrative and part of the story that could be told is about the types of dynamic partnerships that could actually be used to leverage their, their own reputations, right? And to enhance their legitimacy through demonstrating that they're partnering, especially for the U.S., pharmaceutical companies, you know, who are they partnering with to, you know, like universities, although it's an interesting time too, where we see how all of trust, even in universities in the US is going to have to be rebuilt after four years of being um, at having an anti science, um, anti intellectual president, right. And, you know, and that has created so many deeper issues. And how do we incrementally build them up? Of course, there's the PR side of it and telling the story, constructing the narrative. And then there's and then there's the PR side of it that I'm interested in is building better interorganizational relationships and including those relationships as part of their narrative. Right. So, you know, I, I, I think that it's a real opportunity. And I, you know, like Gary Kreps years ago, oh gosh, probably in like 1984, um, made the very obvious point, but was the first one to make it officially, which is these disasters, these crises, these interruptions help magnify normal organizing processes anyway. And so that's where I've kind of, you know, some of my earliest work in partnership with Maureen Taylor was looking at the interruption and the attempts to rebuild a society when we were studying the evolution of the of civil society in Croatia in the early 2000s, right? And then that shifted, <laughs> frankly, for those of you who are students, it shifted because, um, funding opportunities came about and I shifted from doing this kind of more just general civil society and evolution of organizational functions and forms as a, as a, as a result of networks. Um, it shifted into the realm of disasters because funding came into my lap to study the disaster um, that wreaked havoc in the, the Gulf Coast of uh, the U.S. in 2005, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita, the whole 2005 hurricane season was a real mess. And that's when the National Science Foundation here in the U.S. started realizing that this is that opportunity where the Petri dish 
is, is, has been blown up. Right. And it's like, so we can study all sorts of things because of this major interruption. And that's where um, some of the research that I had you read today, some of the underlying things is it's not like it's the first time that we're studying. Um, it's not like it's the first time that we're studying interruptions um, and organizations and trying to figure out how do they survive. This has a long history. As I mentioned in one of my papers, before resilience became kind of the catch all, you know, became trendy and fashionable to talk about you know, organization studies has been studying how, how do organizations, particular types of organizations come to exist and thrive in their environments? And why do some organizational forms work and some don't? And that community ecology framework and organizational ecology framework, um, also uh, complementary management studies include population ecology, um, institutional theory. These theories have been interested in really rolling up their sleeves and understanding how do organizations evolve and how do their networks play into that, right? And so in taking up those theories, then I started focusing in on medium and small businesses. I do find that, and, and truly, I think it's because of our knowledge of organizational forms and um, organizational ecologies that large corporations, while they might suffer interruptions, I, I have found that these are blips on their screens, right? Meaning a disaster can hit and large corporations just have so much capacity and so much redundancy built up in their systems that they're, they're actually not that interesting to study, except that they, under, they, they are actually doing the communication that needs to be done in modeling how it looks because they really they they've mastered it. Some of the missing points are the 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 lack of that almost an intellectual approach that large corporations do. I see in small businesses, and here this is a little um, flyer that I took a picture of in a small business. That um, this is they when I was interviewing and talking with the leaders. They said, this is our emergency plan. This is our resilience plan. <laughs> and if you, I don't know if your screen is big enough, but it essentially said, it essentially is about life-saving techniques. Like if you get, if, if someone gets hurt at work, call 911, right? Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a defibrillator around the corner. This is what they're thinking about when you ask them, what's your crisis plan? This is their crisis plan. They're not thinking about, Oh, well, I know I can count on my, you know, my professional partners or my suppliers to, you know, delay my, my uh, debt or whatever. They're not thinking about that. They're, this is to them what the crisis plan is. And so there's this, this area of research too, where when I look at the, like FEMA in the United States, FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Administration. Um, the American Red Cross, which is part of the Global Red Cross um, organization, um, the Small Business Administration in the U.S., um, these, these organizations all have like checklists for what small businesses like this can do. And those checklists do include the exact types of things, these um, you know, flyers, right? Like make sure your employees know how to save their lives essentially, right? Um, and then they do include, some of them do include checklists, like make sure your partners, your business partners know what your plan is, but that's it. And it's one in a list of a lot of things and that's not unpacked. And of course, unpacking that is what I do, <laughs> peel back those layers. So I think about resilience organizing and the various different institutional practices that we see. Large corporations, interesting in benchmarking the ways that crisis teams often work and respond. Um, interesting in seeing how they do take up organizing processes that cut across the organization. Um, more and more of the large corporations that I've talked with have been able to peek under the hood to see what their um, disaster response work involves is they automatically say, well, we immediately know if there's a, you know, especially in the South where there are lots of, um, hurricanes, um, those large corporations talk about how they immediately mobilize their crisis team, which includes both 
executives that cut across information, financial and um, uh, uh, operations types of executives, but as well as HR professionals, the public relations professionals, you know, it's a, it's a cross functional team. And often also in, they use satellite members so that they can make sure various different divisions um, or units within the organization that are hierarchically differentiated, that those all um, are a part of and on board with it. So they really model it well. But the real niche here is medium and small size businesses their disaster plan is just a lot of creative thinking sometimes, although that's what we thought. And I've been doing some research on really trying to push and test my theory that it's not just networks, but actually a, both a combination of being able to structure formal organizational plans that evoke aspects of formal structures and organizing um, that set the tone then and help to manage the chaos. And so I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about that in a minute too. But nonprofit organizations, um, including, oh, I, I, now your faces aren't on my screen because I'm looking at the screen instead, but uh, including people like so-and-so who's also working in nonprofit sector work who actually works with um, disasters was that uh, that was Aaron. Me, Aaron. It was Aaron. <laughs> yes. Okay. So yes. So you know, this is where we're starting to see too. Nonprofit organizations do tend to have decent plans, though that's been an interesting place to study, and that's where I'll I'll get to it. But that's where I've been doing research now in the realm of nonprofit organizations, uh, particularly in the um, Texas city of Houston that suffered massive flooding, some 80 inches of rain in the space of a couple of days, um, and then additional uh, breaching of, of aqueducts and so forth that flooded the whole city and created a mess. And I've been studying nonprofit organizations there um, because they're hit twice. They already are supposed to be taking care of vulnerable citizens, right? Like, you know, nonprofit organizations that do meal delivery services, for example, or nonprofit organizations that serve the homeless. They're already specifically taking care of vulnerable citizens who the vulnerable citizens themselves are their vulnerability is amplified even more than most people's during disaster. But then the organizations who serve them have to grip, grapple with their own resilience themselves in order to perpetuate their services and take care of those vulnerable people, right? And then of course, government agencies and plural sector organizations, which um, plural sector organizations are those organizations that in the US anyway, um, used to, uh, th they've emerged as a uh, sector that does what used to be done by the government and is now done by nonprofits, but their primary funding comes from grants from our government. And so they kind of fit in a little bit of a different space in terms of types of organizations. But if you think about these institutional practices, we see these different organizational types existing in cross-sector inter-organizational relationships that are themselves um, a type of organizing form. And someone named Matt Kloshman, who's a professor at University of Colorado at Boulder, has written a really nice piece that unpacks how inter-organizational relationships are a form of organization in and of themselves. So we can actually think about organizing functions um, in, in, in such uh, inter-organizational relationships, much the way we think about organizing inside organizations, right? So we start thinking about, and this is where, I, for those of you who um, had a chance to view the different papers I shared, this is a paper that um, the Dorfel 2016 book chapter in, a, in, a, in communities and health uh, volume, I talk about the simultaneity of formal and informal forms of organizing in all organizations. And when social networks was initially um, written about in organization studies, social networks were seen as the organization behind the chart, meaning the chart, the hierarchy is the formal structure, the way communication is supposed to flow in organizations. And networks are the ways in which people actually communicate in organizations. 
but I would, I, I will argue, um, and I'm starting to do this in uh, papers that I'm publishing now, that the formal structure actually enables the informal structure, right? And interestingly, there is some research too that talks about problems with networked forms of organizing. And I'm sure many of you um, are, 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 maybe not, are, are uh, let me see if I can change this. There we go. Um, when you think about networked forms of organizing or team organized organizations, what do you all think of? Uh, what what comes to mind when you think about networked organizations, even if it's like inside an organization that has a more of a network or team approach to organizing? How do you view that compared to what might be a more traditional institution uh, like a government agency that might have a hierarchy and broken into departments? What do you think what do you think of teams as organizing as an organizing approach what's different do you think well we can say maybe that they uh, emerged organically uh, so they would be more resilient um, because of this organic uh, emergence so everything works without imposure so it's a bottom line approach and that's kind of what I'm also doing in my studies. I'm focusing on the people and on the public and how they organize, mm -hmm. particularly the public, you know, looking at the public's engagement <laughs> in organization. Um, so, so maybe that's yeah. different. Yeah, I think that's a really important component, right? Is the idea that team, in theory, team-based organizations or networked organizations are emergent. They enable, they allow for the teams to form a, and they organize around problems. So in theory, teams can change over time as the problems they're grappling with change. So in theory, team approaches to organizing or networked approaches to organizing um, are supposed to be these nimble dynamic organizations and within them working groups, you know, think of like a Google or a, you know, or a lot of, a lot of software companies where the, there's not a lot of formal structure because they want ideas and innovation to generate. So who you work with might be a function of what questions do you have, right? And so the network enables that and it expects us then to know who we should be talking to. So a lot of organizations like that rely on communication and information technologies and intranets to ma manage a knowledge network where you can tag people based on their keywords, their expertise and so forth, right? In organization theory, interestingly enough, we see like all human systems, it comes with its own foibles and flaws in that even networked organizations like this, in theory, they're nimble and dynamic and therefore would be more resilient. But the reality is they also run the risk of being as structured and rigid as hierarchically designed organizations. And why do you think that's the case? It depends on the structure of the network. Uh, and the power maybe that distributed among the network? Um, Close, it has to do with whether the network structure is actually dynamic and changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and or, also on the, yeah, on the power of individuals, on the social capital for particular individuals. So, you know, there are leaders um, and there are people on the periphery, um, you know, all those, all those different dynamics that's happening, who can, who has relationship, who, can, who has access to others. Mm -hmm. I would also say that the network organizations that are slower than the hierarchical organizations just because there's so much information going on and so much sense needs to be made before some, some decision is taken uh, is, 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 is accepted, I don't know. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> those are some of my thoughts. And we also see that in, you know, think about this. Think, especially since so, several of you are um, students still, think about, I'm sure your undergraduate experience wasn't long ago when you were forced to work in teams in your undergraduate classes and you get those, you know, those bad group members. And then all of a sudden you take a few more classes with the same gang of people and you start gravitating towards, you start knowing who's going to deliver and who's going to be good, a good worker, right? 
And so you start going to the same people from class to class to class. And we see that trend happen too. In social networks, we tend to we tend to take a while, especially when we're thinking about partnering with other organizations, it takes a while to build trust and credibility. And so when you're dealing with complex problems, you want the best people on board, right? You want to build a coalition that works and you, that that's a network form is coalition building is a network. But you also are skeptical until you see someone is going to deliver. And so that inter-organizational trust gets built very incrementally. And often, you know, some practical advice about that is that, you know, don't, don't put all of your eggs in one basket, number one. Number two, um, build it slowly. Like first, first and foremost, try to make sure they deliver on some smaller projects first before you jump in at, to a major project together, right? But what happens, um, and an author named Hales has written about how networks can become just as rigid because it is very natural for us to um, go back to those tried and true relationships, to the relationships that delivered in the past. So it's easier to go to someone that can deliver on the past, um, it, that who delivered in the past, because it's a good predictor that they're going to deliver in the future, except that that means you're picking them based on their reliability and your trust in them, as opposed to necessarily making sure you have the most uh, appropriate expert for the task at hand, right? Um, May I ask a question here? Just curious, <clears throat> just had a thought, because when you were talking about this, I was thinking about the combination between hierarchy and the networked approach. Because if you remember, like the case with Netflix, you know, they were one company at one point, and then they had a huge human resource uh, management program, when they basically cut out all ineffective, unengaged people and left only stars. And, you know, and, and, and basically, you know, that does the kind of, they reevaluated the networks. Uh, reevaluated the the bad spots over there, the bad sheep, and they cut out on them. Them, but they still allowed the people who are engaged and who want to do something and who are excited. They allowed them to still kind of network and 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 build on their own. So it was interesting, you know, how they combined this hierarchical cleaning sort of things, yeah. but yet still allowed this teams and networking relationships emerge uh, very organically. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think I heard a question in there, but it, I think that's really in line with um, an intervention that an organization actually did. I mean, I, I would also argue that that's a, um, I'm sorry, my, my watch is buzzing at me and it's going to distract me if I don't stop it. It's telling me to, to take a break and do some stretching. <laughs> um, it's a... Uh, it, it, be, there, it becomes an ethical quandary as well, right? Like all of us studying communication, regardless of the way in which you're approaching it, we are, we are developing a deep understanding of how social relationships work and how we can manipulate them, right? And, and Netflix cleaned house and got rid of the underperformers. And what stayed is the, the engaged, oh, probably overperformers, right? And you don't want to, you know, I, I see this in, in professional circles. You know, I see some assistant professors publish unbelievably more than what they need to because they're so paranoid about tenure. And yet at the same time, so it raises the bar and you want to encourage that. I mean, if this is your passion, publish if that's what you want to do. But it, but it becomes this frenetic race, right? And that race keeps getting tougher and tougher because that, that then means someone that looked engaged five years ago looks like they're just plodding along compared to someone who might come up the pike, right? And so Netflix too, it's, it, it, I, I would love to be a, a fly on the wall when they made those decisions to see, you know, was it, does this perpetuate a, a, an even deeper culture of workaholism and an inability for people to live whole robust lives? Um, and, you know, there are some people that work is their life and you don't want to begrudge that, but notice how that, that creates a recursive cycle of, you know, more and more work. Right. And, but then likewise too, though, um, what Hales talked about when he warned about networks becoming as rigid as hierarchies is the idea that, you know, look, unless there's an interruption, unless you're trained on this, 
you don't realize you naturally network with people who are just like you, right? So this is why you should never make your final decision about hiring someone based on whether you want to have a beer with them, because you tend to want to have a beer with someone who's just like you. So you perpetuate the, the type of person that's already at work, right? And you undermine the whole idea of diversity. Who knew we'd get into that as a particular thing tonight? But that same argument then goes with, you want to work in a, in a career where you're trying to be innovative. Hell says, careful what you do. You naturally want to work with those that you can predict are going to be trustworthy and will deliver. But you also need to work with the expert on the particular problem. But you also then tend to see managers when they have opportunities to rebuild teams, they constantly rebuild their teams with the same people that have always delivered for them in the past. So when we see professional hires across organizational boundaries, right, like we often see non-compete clauses in people these days in some companies, but a lot of professions, you can be scooped away and stolen from a competing organization. Well, and a lot of times when a person is scooped away and hired, they come in, they take over that particular unit in their organization, and then they bring all their buddies from their other job with them and hire their buddies on. And so they're, they're bringing the exact same team, and now they're the new guys in the organization that have now dissed <laughs> the existing people in the organization. Doesn't always happen, Hale says, the interruption, knowing that we tend to network with those who are like us, and especially in these interorganizational relationships where trust is built so incrementally and slowly, know that these are issues and interrupt that by understanding and asking yourself, am I asking this, this person or this organization to partner because they've always been a tried and true partner or because they're the best expert for this particular work, right? And so we see these types of um, practices happening. And I, I, I'm sorry, I've, I've changed my slides so I can see all of you and I've forgotten that my slides are staring in front of you. Um, I'm gonna skip that. And, and I will say too, I will just clarify, there's communication infrastructure theory, which this is um, like Balro Keach and colleagues have looked at community ecology very qualitatively. Um, this is all, there are Venn diagrams across all of these, right? Um, Brian Houston in 2015 wrote a bit about communication systems and resources and talked about, again, the ecology, and he amped it up and updated the communication infrastructure theory. And again, these are all overlapping um, areas of research. And I home in on this, the area of the community relationships where my access point is the organizations, which I think I clearly stated a, a bit too. And interorganizational relationships then, we already are starting to see why they happen, but in organization studies, um, going back to what I started with a, a, about 25 minutes ago, has been around long before we were studying disaster research and looking at organizational resilience. And organizations build interorganizational relationships for their own survival anyway, regardless of whether an interruption may be coming down the pipe, right? And so we see interorganizational relationships get built because they need resources. Organizations need resources. They, those resources end up develop, building um, networks that create their own version of a political economy, or as Matt Kloshman has written about, the idea that interorganizational relationships are a form of organization themselves, right? And they're their own political economy, meaning there are asymmetries of power embedded in these networked relationships, right? There's a lot of environmental uncertainty. Um, we see organizations building these too, not just to access resources, but also to advocate, right? To, for their own political interests, for some collective action reasons. And we also see organizations partner with other organizations because of needs for legitimization, right? For community identification. We see also symbolic identification with cultural values start happening and emerging when organizations um, exist in coalitions or in broader networks in their environments, right? And so just kind of um, clarifying some of the key points about organizing at this interorganizational level has the same types of issues of power and control that internal organizations have, right? 
And so this is where I've written about um, communication in bureaucracies we see tends to be task oriented. The direction and flow of the communication is vertical. The mode or the, the channel of communication is usually written. It's codified, right? Like this is what a hierarchy or formal organizational form looks like. The style of communication is tested, you know, workshopped, made sure that it's, you know, formal and clear, right? Whatever clear means. Of course, we've all seen clear communication in our credit card statements where it has the fine print, it, you know, it's, it's so clear you can't read it. It, be, it ambiguates it again, right? It comes full circle. But then, so what is the, what does communication content, direction and flow of communication, mode and channel of communication and style of communication then look like in networks of organizations as opposed to in organizations organized through bureaucratic assumptions what do networks tell us then what is the content right what do you what do you think the content pick any of these four things content direction um mode or channel style of communication what, where do you so this is just drawing from my experience but one of the things I've, I've across the organization that i run um an organization i'm working with at the moment and i helped organize the women's march in sydney in 2017 um, all of which are very flat organisations, very much that network, and all of which use Slack um, because it has that only the people who need to know certain things opt into the channels, um, very informal communication, um, and, and, yeah, that very flat communicative structure. Right, right, right. There's, there's not an appointed person in charge or responsible there's a shared responsibility right and right and social media and technologies like slack now facilitate what seems to be more team-based communication and live live and um symmetric right like because it's happening simultaneously right as opposed to asymmetric and one-way style communication right the codified language of bureaucracies is you read this, you should understand it, right? The style of communication in that sense is formal and clear. In the sense of what you're describing, Erin, my guess is that communication, the style of communication is meaning-centered. It's trying to peel back the layers and try to reach mutual understanding as opposed to, and, and, and recognizing that how I go into a conversation, my understanding of what I think needs to be done, I, it, I enter it and recognize it may transform over time, as opposed to a style of communication, the bureaucracy is, this is how it is, and it's a, it, and it's a, a stable, stagnated sort of thing. I, I think stagnated is unfair. I think formal would be a, a fair way to describe that, right? And so we usually- so one particular example of um, in an organisation that I'm working with at the moment, um, Equality Australia, who are a group that um, lobbies on behalf of uh, LGBTQI people, um, everyone fills in there what are they working on every day in Slack, including the CEO. So mm -hmm. it's that idea of um, not only is there no hierarchy, but everyone has to contribute that information every day, I think is quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. And that can create problems of information overload, no doubt too, right? I mean, we all suffer from that at work anyway, but when we, it is a problem and a challenge with networked forms is in that direction of communication flow, that second line there, you know, in bureaucracies, it's fairly easy to see that it's supposed to flow up and down, right? Like you have an, a report to, boss right you have and you let that boss know what they're supposed you, what you've been doing and there's a reporting structure in these networks where everyone is kind of sharing information and reporting to everyone and it and it also then means in networked forms you're relying on people to be pithy to say what they need to say without it taking screens and screens right and so all of a sudden our communication skills are even more amplified and and there's a lot more pressure for us to be really efficient in our communication even though we're being 
effective and comprehensive in our communication. And striking that balance is always a problem. I, I'm sure we've all seen the emails where um, I, I, I have a former colleague who, not, not any on the call, who I was notorious for not editing the emails. And it would be a, an email would come and it would be five times too long, literally five times too long. That person could have taken the first one or two sentences of each paragraph and written those one or two sentences and taken care of it. Right. But it, but it comes with this whole idea too. like the Slack channels can become great resources. And luckily they're searchable, but um, they're also quite comprehensive, aren't they? You know, so information overload becomes an issue and something that gets reconciled and dealt with through, I would argue, balancing out these things and starting to recognize what's worth saving too. And it's okay to start turning around and cycling back and thinking about, okay, we've we've procured all of this information. It's it's time for us to turn it into something that's a little bit more cogent, right? So when we um, think about these uh, interorganizational relationships, of course, they have interpersonal qualities. We, the, uh, the types of interorganizational relationships range in terms of trust and competition and historical context, and they evolve and so forth. But they are also um, a lot more complex because they do come with um, the organization's reputation. It's network's reputation, right? Especially for Aaron and those of you that might uh, be more active and involved in nonprofit organizations, you know, often nonprofit organizations build coalitions. And so their, so their reputation is also then nested in a larger coalition's reputation, right? And so, so there's a lot more coordinating pressure to deliver. And so these interorganizational relationships are not just the same as interpersonal relationships um, because of the complexities that organizations bring. But they're also, they're regulated through policy. And that's where, again, for those of you who had a chance to read it, this is why there's some logic behind understanding theories like institutional theory is because these types of interorganizational relationships, sometimes they form organically because of the network. Sometimes they form because they have to. There's a coercion element, right? Policy prescribes it. Um, Yannick Atuba and a former student of mine, Jack Harris and I wrote a paper on how we see even in the granting um, sector, the interorganizational relationships can often be coerced, meaning some grantors, at least in the United States, we found that federal agencies often require <laughs> nonprofit organizations that receive grants. They require those nonprofits to report on partnerships and to have interorganizational partnerships as part of the requirement for them to even get the funding. And now let's pause and think about that for a minute. They're mandated partnerships. So is that a network or is that a hierarchy or is that a bureaucracy, right? We, we often see that as there, there are institutions that do matchmaking and say, oh, we're the funder. You, you want the money you want the money, you two should work together. And so they match make, and those, match, those matches can be very functional and symbiotic, but they're also in a sense a mandate, right? Because the organizations looking for the grant money need to do what they are told by the organization holding the purse strings. That resource dependent relationship creates that power dynamic and it doesn't fit nicely into a bureaucratic form or a networked form, but it's certainly a form of power and control that exists in the interorganizational relationships, right? Um, and these other factors go into this as well. So we've talked about these types of forms of control. We can even think about them in terms of obtrusive and unobtrusive forms of control, which incidentally, again, since you all are um, in the realm of public relations and other fields, um, obtrusive and unobtrusive control is kind of like ORGCOM 101. It's like the, the, the basic level of control that we think about in organizations. And then another type of control at the bottom, you see disciplinary control is really, if you think about the type of um, 
self-motivation we have often because we know if we don't produce, if we don't do our work, we might not have a job in the future. We use our own discipline to, to control ourselves and to convince ourselves to work and get up every day and deliver, right? And Foucault talks about that in a lot more depth, but in, in a sense, we see disciplinary control in our internal motivations. He argues, however, because often we're being watched by the institution we're being monitored by the institution and held accountable by the institution. So even if the institution doesn't see our actions in a day-to-day -day basis, they are going to know. And so we work and deliver because we've got that kind of that invisible hand over our shoulder. So these different types of control can happen too in inter-organizational relationships. So um, I'm actually, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute because I realized that I'm spending lots of time talking about theory, and I think there are some interesting things to get to. Um, did, I, did I stop sharing? Yes. We, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, there are some other interesting issues that I'd like to get to, and I'm going to find those slides too. But um, uh, while we start thinking about these evolutions then that organizations experience, we start realizing that, that in the context of disaster, they all get blown up. So in the um, research paper um, in 2010, the Dorfel, Lay, and Schooning paper, we took the idea of social capital, right? Social capital being um, something that's built up through relationships. And um, network scholars say, without the relationship, you don't have social capital. So if you have, all right, now, now I'm going to go back and share a screen, some pictures. It's time for some pictures, don't you think? Um, so if, if social capital is embedded in relationships, network scholars will say that without a link, without some sort of relationship, you lose social capital in that network, right? And there's an interesting thing here, right? So this network that you see um, on the left is rich in social capital. Everyone's communicating with everyone. Interestingly, Maureen, um, if you're not looking at your screen, I do, this is a really nice picture from the Croatia research. It's really handy to illustrate examples of different types of social capital. So you're, you're a piece of this talk now, officially. But anyways, though the left side is an example of a network that's rich in social capital from the, from if you're looking at it through that lens, because there, everyone's communicating to everyone. Now, granted, there's another, there are different types of social capital, right? In the network on the right is a more radial network. In other words, not everyone's communicating with everyone. And if you think about it, when you think about if you work for one of these organizations and your network is supposed to look like on the left, all you're doing is working in the coalition. You got nothing else going on. Who has time to maintain those relationships, right? On the right is a little bit more of an efficient structure. And that's where you see theoreticians like, uh, uh, like Ron Burt, who talks about structural holes in networks and that organizations that, in, in networks that strike a balance of structural holes, they don't, they're not overly, exhaustive in their relationships. They're sufficient in their relationships to facilitate and mobilize when needed, right? And so that's a, that's a structural approach to the network. And recall there are different types of uh, social capital. Structural social capital refers to just do links exist or not. Relational social capital gets into the communication relationship, the nature of the communication that may exist. Um, it, do the, do the uh, members of that relationship communicate about more than one topic, but have a more robust or multiplex relationship, right? Um, and then cognitive social capital. Do we share our, the same views about our orientation towards the norms and values and cultures in our relationships, right? So in, in the case of Bert, he talks about social capital only as a structural feature, as look, if these ties exist, that's sufficient for building social network in a relationship. Communication scholars have gotten into the quality of those relationships, right? 
and trying to understand then what does social what does that healthy social capital look like um uh from a communication point of view and let me see here uh And what we start seeing is some of the research that um, sorry, I'm I'm uh, moving my I, apparently I'm not moving my slides right now. Sorry, I'm going to pause a second here. I'm trying I'm working with multiple screens and apparently I'm not exactly doing a good job of that. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna just move through here the old fashioned way. So here, so when we start thinking about this more deeply, the social network scholars think about links in relationships. And if there's a link, there's some social capital. In the 2010 piece uh, on the Hurricane Katrina disaster and organizations and what, what facilitated their ability to be resilient and how did they engage relationships to do that, that structural piece of social capital mattered, right? In New Orleans, the, uh, some of you might be too young to remember this, but in 2005 in New Orleans, when Hurricane Katrina swept through, um, it caused the entire city to shut down first with evacuation notices, and the, there was mandatory evacuation of an entire city, which was unprecedented. Now, granted, that left a lot of people without infrastructure, that this is where the US has some, some really bad um, experience with taking care of our most vulnerable because the news, if you Google Hurricane Katrina, the news will show you how we left our poor and most vulnerable um, behind and standing on roofs and dying in, in the floods uh, because they had no way of escaping and they could not leave the city, right? For the organizations that meso level, uh, when I was interviewing them, I was curious, what did they do? Because what does a city, how do you decide to go back? This city was shut down six months later. It still wasn't even at 50% um, the population that it was pre-Katrina, right? And so you have to ask yourself, who goes back first? Who, what happens first? The schools? The, but the schools don't open unless there are kids to go to the schools. But parents don't go back unless there are jobs. Um, you know, like what, what happens first? It's a quandary. And that's where the discovery about the simple, the BERT version, structural social capital, the organization leaders that I interviewed did feel confidence in just knowing their colleagues, their networks that they had in advance would be there. And I did interview a few, a few organizations that weren't so uh, resilient and that were actually quite vulnerable. And they didn't, you know, one person literally said in his interview, when I was like, so did you talk to your business partners? Did you did you reach out to you know your chamber of commerce? Because this happened to be someone that has a really strong, robust chamber of commerce. And he said, look, I'm just not a joiner, right? He, he was isolated in his network. He had no network. So he had no structural social capital. He didn't have that confidence of knowing others were going to be back because he didn't have a network to go back to because he really just kind of, in, in some ways it's a, it's, it's maybe a harsh um, uh, metaphor, but in some ways he was like barnacle on a ship, right? He was a small business that wasn't thinking strategically about relationships and building relationships in his environment. He just always assumed customers, customers would come to his store, right? And it was, and think about this too, 2005, not all businesses had websites in those days. So all he could do, he was very frustrated and all he could do was sit back and say, the, the, the city, when is the city gonna reopen, right? Versus many organizations like his own who had thought more strategically about their relationships and had reached out and were joiners, they felt confident and they went back anyway before customers were back because they knew that, you know, they knew their buddies would be back. And, and so they started after they, and, and this is where the, 
oh so unattractive if any graphic designers are in the room please forgive me for my bad model that's in the 2010 piece but that's where that model comes from is in this disaster moment organizations do stop working because the leaders the employees are taking care of their own livelihood right they're they're following the steps that um, you know, that are posted, like save your own life first, right? So, and then as they start recognizing, okay, we're in a safe position, they start stabilizing their own particular organizations, but in their back of their mind, they had confidence of going back because of that structural social capital that they had. That was a really important discovery for thinking about motivating and inspiring organizations to think about building inter-organizational relationships, almost like a form of social insurance right? It wards you from threats. It wards off threats from the environment, right? Is recognizing that you have these relationships. What I think is interesting too, and this is evolving and I haven't published this in any one spot, but I was lucky enough. I see Kim Johnson joined the call too. Thanks for joining Kim. Um, I was lucky enough to have some time to think through this a little bit more in a chapter that I wrote for uh, uh, Maureen and Kim in their engagement handbook. And it was the idea of what, what else am I seeing here? Even though I see the world from a social network point of view, I also recognize that there are bureaucracies at play and those formal structures can give um, order out of chaos sometimes, right? And, and, and that's important. But also, you know, we in the social network world think about relationships in terms of uh, weak and strong ties, social capital being embedded in the, in the networks, right? And then we describe ties in terms of intimacy, candor, right? Reciprocity and the amount of time we spend together. And the more of those four dimensions that we have with another or, um, partner, the more strong that tie becomes, right? And so it ranges on this weak, strong tie continuum. But something that I saw, and I said this in the 2010 paper, which is that, you know, um, the, the, the social networks, the social capital rather didn't need to be nurtured. Some ties that were quite latent and weren't attended to, you know, they weren't besties and they were very, very, very weak on the weak tie continuum. You know, they came through. So social network didn't have, or social capital, excuse me, didn't have to be nurtured as much as the management theorists talk about, right? But of course, in this context, I started realizing, well, what else is going on here? But in the context of disaster, there's an, uh, there's a, it, it, it amplifies shared goals. Like we'd really like, we don't want to see your business go out of business where, you know, you might be our competitor, but we don't want to win the competition game this way. And you start seeing this sense of a, a bit more of a humanity playing through, at least in early phases, I've seen this in the inter-organizational networks. And this is where I started thinking about the idea that, you know, some of these relationships are these more engaged ties where suddenly you might be, you might have no relationship, but standing in a way, if I can use this, think about volunteers in a disaster situation, standing shoulder to shoulder with each other, two strangers can all of a sudden work really well together. They don't have a history of a relationship there. They both showed up as volunteers. They're standing shoulder to shoulder and helping others to survive this, this catastrophic event, right? Well, they're engaged. They, if there's a clear goal at hand, right? In, in the early phases after a disaster, it's saving lives, right? So it was, it, so I'm starting to think about the idea that, that weak, strong tie relationships, maybe I'll, I'll humbly say, maybe aren't a necessary cause to organizational resilience, at least in those critical early stages. If there's shared humanity and we engage and agree about the orientation, then we will start communicating with each other in ways that are consistent with things like Kent and Taylor's dialogic communication, where we're actually participating as equal interlocutors, right? You know, it's ongoing communicative orientation. You're constantly checking with each other to figure out what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, it might range from com competitive to conflict oriented, because you might actually debate what's the best thing to do in this situation when life is at stake or whatnot, right? And then that's also this idea that there's, 
you know, from the sociologists um, like Haider talking about balance theory, this idea that two people might share some common view of some third object and there's balance in that relationship. So in, in other words, we, we see that engaged ties might be the necessary comp component to kind of jumpstart resilience organizing. And then we might jump the tracks and start seeing, and we do see that even in the, the model in the 2010 piece, that then as things start um, organizing and being less chaotic, organizations later in the process start going to their inter-organizational relationships, right? But in those really early phases, not so much. And interestingly, um, and this is something I'm working on right now, and then uh, I'm gonna leave it from there. I, I, I'm sorry, I have to go through this the old fashioned way here. I wanna find this. So we're seeing that the formal um, structures and networks really improve resilient processes in certain ways. We're starting to see that now. And that's because inside, and so my recent work in um, Houston, which I did not share any of these papers yet. One in fact is just in press now, just got accepted. Years later, we're, we're seeing the light of day in our papers and our hard work getting published. A couple of other papers too, but the empirical pieces from it. Um, we're starting to see that formal structures, especially if you look at the organizations and what they're doing. And in the Houston research, I started peeling back the layers and saying, yes, organizations, I usually study and enter in at the organization level and study the interorganizational relationships. In the Houston work, I went into the organization and did a lot of um, uh, uh, shadowing, um, in-depth interviews, a lot of content analysis from emails that I was fortunate enough that organizations shared weeks of emails that they produced during the storm itself so we could see the types of organizing that they were doing. And what we discovered was that the formal structures became a foundation that set the stage for the social networks to work. So in fact, in, um, in one social service network, for example, many of the organizations, their, their, their evolution started a lot like the model that I have in the um, Dorfel et al. 2010 piece, where in that piece, the model, I should have had that here. I don't have a slide of that, but it starts from the uh, leaders took care of themselves and their families and made sure they were alive and safe first. Then as soon as they stabilized their families, they turned to their employees. And then they started working on their organizations and then they built up their interorganizational relationships. So in that part of it, we actually peeled back, um, sorry, so distracting when she doesn't know how to uh, manage her, her slides. We started peeling back then the organizing processes, right? Where now we've started looking at the cycle and we the emergency was enacted because of the floods, right? And we did see that the, or, and so now we started interviewing and tracking organizations, internal structures a lot more deeply than just the leader themselves, which the New Orleans data was, the leaders reported what was going on on behalf of their organizations. In this, we did a deeper field study of a network of organizations internally as well. The individuals, we assume that they're taking care of themselves and making sure they're alive first. But interestingly, the individual employees, workers, could act and react immediately and enact basic work functions without having to communicate with each other because they understood and had a clear sense of what their roles were. And if you think about that, a role in a job is a bureaucratic element, right? right? If we understand what our responsibilities are within the role of the job that we have, we can do some of the basic work without having to take it up the hierarchy, right? And so those individuals, what we saw in these data is individuals before they even communicated with each other were able to do work while they were at home, some of whom were in dire circumstances themselves. So interestingly, which goes back to an initial thing that I, I don't remember if I said this or not, 
the organization took precedent. The individuals were so keen on making sure their services, social services that they deliver to um, infirm people were not gonna be interrupted, that they weren't necessarily resilient in their own psychology and in their own families, but they were working. They were supporting the organization's resilience, right? They worked on their own. Then as they started realizing, and through the emails, we could see this, they started realizing each other were okay. Then they shifted the content of their communication. It's not like they weren't communicating with each other, but they didn't bother each other with work stuff when they felt like they weren't sure if each other were okay, yet the individuals were working independently. And then the, inner, the emails started evolving and showing that they were now exchanging information and working together. And by the way, Aaron, they do not use Slack in this particular system that I studied. They were doing reply all emails, everybody's worst nightmare. But they started doing that. And notice what happens in this screen that you see here. So the workers then start interacting. They can act because the formal bureaucratic structures empowered them to know what they could do without having to be redundant. This happened at the organization level too, because this, organi this set of organizations had a really good understanding of what their various different inter-organizational partners do in terms of their mission. So they were very efficient and did not worry about taking on new work beyond the scope of their mission. They could focus even more heartily on their own mission-driven work because they had deep knowledge that others would be delivering and a history of that knowledge that those others would deliver as well. And then you started seeing, even before they entered into inter-organizational collaboration, there was still just organizations stabilizing themselves. And we started simultaneously then at that point seeing the symbols of unity emerge where schools are starting to reopen, where um, organizations are now starting to reach out to their inter-organizational partners. And this came later and the inter-organizational networks start activating as we start seeing life emerge, right? And so um, a, an important lesson I think to take away from these studies that I've been doing and all this yammering I've been doing for the past um, hour plus is that, you know, the communication can be can really help us improve our resilience when it is both formal and the formalities paradoxically are designed to support the networks and the it, it, maybe not the networks but the it, the the improvisation and the more in the moment activities that might have to be taken up because of the uniqueness of the problems you're facing. But yet the, the formal structures end up supporting the, um, the informal structures in very important and meaningful ways. And this is something that we're now contributing to the resilience literature is that we not only see that, but, and this is my final point, is that while like the crisis literature that you're all familiar with, we often see it organized over time in terms of tasks. Like we often say, oh, you do planning before the crisis hits. You know, during the crisis, you're dealing with the crisis. After the crisis, you're figuring out the lessons learned. Then you're revising your plans so that you have better plans for the next time. And we're actually saying the organizing moves, it, it, if we're going to study this in a dynamic way, we can actually chunk up chunks of time based on the levels of interaction that evolve from the individual who relies on their formal job and is working even though they're not interacting with others to then an organization level to then an inter-organizational level, which is a departure from usual um, phase-based models that describe phases of disaster recovery in terms of tasks. Instead, we can think about it in terms of le levels of organizing and communicating across those levels. So those are my those are my things that I've been thinking about. There's a lot of theory um, in the uh, it, it, that that comes from management and organization studies that um, uh, undergirds a lot of this. And then we see what's evolving as the science of resilience that really is a complex thing where there's there's tons of research at each of those levels as well, at the individual inter-organization inter and inter-organizational level. 
May I ask a quick question? Um, yes, sir. It's just very interesting. How do you define resilience in that particular paper? Because you know there, there's still many discussions on, on the definitions, and and I'm just you know curious how you define it because we also talk about how actually resilient organizations. I mean, tell me how you define it, and then maybe I'll ask you more. Sure. Sure. Well, resilience. I view resilience as a process, not a trait. And yet we do, you know, it's two sides of the same coin in some ways, right? Like, and um, and yet I see it as, and Buzznell talks about this as well, that if we think about resilience as a process, it's not some golden goal, right? It's more like it's an ongoing process of communicating, organizing, and engaging across people and organizations that so that it facilitates and mitigates the interruption of services. So we still do see this idea of can you perpetuate the work that you're doing, right? But um, but it's also a matter of it's a set of processes that support um, a disinterruption of services. So, you know, we often though think like we describe ourselves as resilient in terms of traits, right? And traits are, traits only take you so far, right? A, a, a trait, you know, we can say we're resilient. Well, it's because we do certain things that enable us to, you know, like think about how we're surviving this pandemic. You know, there, and, and by the way, I don't think of resilience as very monolithic either. Right, because I see it as a process, it's okay that there are some days that you're not going to feel very resilient. I, I'm not joking. I decided that even though I've been able to work through the pandemic, and I'm very fortunate, I think probably many on this call are that our jobs are in the realm of information so we can work despite not being in a physical place necessarily. So I appreciate that privilege. Yet at the same time, there are definitely days that I have not been as productive as I could be. I'm like, I am not very resilient. What were the interruptions? What, what interrupted my resilience was actually the things I do to perpetuate a productivity level. So, you know, so we do think about resilience when we use it in the vernacular, we think about it as an outcome of, oh, I'm still working, right? But if you think about it from a communication stance, you think about it as a set of communication practices that support that. And now I'm saying as a result of some of this research that I've been doing is it's beyond, you know, we can think about organizations as resilient because they're robust, they have redundancy built in them, they have these physical or, or social structural features, um, you know, more than one person can accomplish the same task. Not all organizations have that kind of capacity, right? But those are features that the policy world thinks about when they think about resilience is um, robustness, redundancy, uh, rapidity, right? Like the, the these, these things that embody a, an organization designing something so it can keep working. But the communication world, we're saying actually resilience organizing says, says Look at your networks. What does what what kind of social capital do you have? When an interruption occurs, will there be shared views? Like right, like think about that slide I had with weak ties versus engaged ties. Notice engaged ties might not happen if there's controversy about what the disaster actually is. When it's physical, like fires or floods or hurricanes, we can agree about that disaster. It's an interesting thing about the pandemic is that it's become politicized. And so we don't see agreement about what the, the disaster is when it comes to the pandemic. And so we don't see the same types of engagement. And we see a lot of more weak tie, strong tie types relationships playing out because you have to find similar organizations that view the pandemic similarly. <laughs> So that's a really long answer to a short question, sorry. No, that's kind of exactly what I was thinking because I did read about rapidity and, 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 and resourcefulness and you know all those kind of things. And one of the thoughts I had is like, I, I wasn't, because I mean, I also think resilience is a process, but I guess I'm more into, I mean, I'm, I, well, that explains what I'm thinking about my dissertation, which is basically 
uh, how you're measuring, you know, how, how, how like what do you consider organizations as more resilient or not resilient? Because they usually say resilient organizations is that they have a few kind of less a break of interruptions, you know, they kind of can, you know, shorter one, but then they go back. So yeah. I guess I was just thinking, you know, how you think about this in, in, in that sense. I'm just, yeah. just, just very curious. Thank you so much. Yeah. So interesting. Well, and, Thank you. And that's actually also why I thought that a good resource for you all would be the proven, <coughs> excuse me, the proven and no word paper, because they talk about, you know, they, they do a nice job helping. Whereas I've been doing a lot of descriptive studies where I don't have necessarily a, a dependent variable that I'm testing and manipulating it that is an external measure of resilience per se, right? But that proven and Millward article is a nice way of thinking about what are some outcomes, what are some, what are some deliverables that organizations would have to have in order to say, okay, that they're resilient, right? Like are how many people, for example, when it comes to like the or, the network of organizations I studied in um, Houston, um, you know, how quickly were they able to get back their full services, right? Um, and that that's something apart from studying the organizing processes is actually having a number of days between the disaster hitting and the, and then some magical date when it's like, yeah, we kind of stabilized by around here. And the organizations that I interviewed and, and informants that I talked with did have multiple ways to assess that. Like one, one organization literally, um, the informant looked at her phone. It was an HR um, manager, a, a, an executive, and she pulled up her calendar and she said, well, for the first two weeks, I had seven to 10 conference calls per day. You'll do. Right. Well, no, 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 about the disaster, about like the, the crisis team was meeting that many times per day. And then she kept scrolling through her calendar and said, oh, oh here it is, right. And it was like this magical date. There was like, all of a sudden there was this Monday that they wrapped up their final conference calls and like that Sunday they only had three or four of them and then by that Monday they didn't need to schedule anymore but the crisis team was in this mock level of organizing and then all of a sudden they were able to say okay and then on that Monday and it was about two weeks later we were kind of doing back back to our old tasks and the crisis team wasn't meeting anymore right that was a large corporation they were they are quite resilient as I mentioned in the beginning, large corporations in some ways aren't that interesting because they are res they are efficient and resilient. And, and that wasn't the case with the nonprofits that I was studying. It did take longer, but they are also dealing with, you know, homeless, infirm, hungry, and so forth, right? And so the, their processes, and, and for them, I had to look at other things like how many meals did the meal delivery service organization um, when did it return back to its normal delivery routes, right? And when did, when when was it able to actually staff the delivery routes? Like I looked at other things like that. But the Millward and Proven article that's in the packet that Michael probably shared with you, um, they get into some various different outcomes that you can study at the community level that are indicators, right? Like population indicators of you know, for nonprofit organizations, and Maureen and I have uh, done this together, uh, consulting with um, organizations like, what, what does it mean to build capacity, right? And that's how we got involved in doing some, um, some consulting, frankly, for organizations working in Afghanistan, is they had said to USAID, when they got their $20 million grant, we're going to show that we'll know we're successful in mobilizing the um, media sector in Afghanistan because we'll have built better, stronger, denser networks among media organizations because we know they're early, you know, think about going back to community ecology theory, early in the life cycle of a field. And in this case, in our Afghanistan, they were early in their life cycle of news media organizations in Afghanistan used to be controlled by the Taliban and were propaganda machines. And then all of a sudden 
the news media opens up in Afghanistan, how do you trust the news, right? And so there's this pro proliferation of news sources available. And so the nonprofit that was training news producers and news stations and so forth, the, that, that nonprofit said, we'll know we have capacity because we'll have facilitated these organizations to partner with each other and share information so they can learn together about what does it mean to deliver news that's relatively objective and not propaganda, right? And so that nonprofit organization asked us to do, Maureen, did you do that too? Or did I do just the network no, stuff? No, no. Yeah, and they asked me then to, to do a network analysis of the media sector network where the node is the organizations and the network. And I tracked them over the course of a couple of years um, and showed how they built capacity in that network as measured by density mm -hmm. and social capital. So, you know, so there are different ways that you can assess it. And when you're doing your dissertation, there might be some population level things or deliverables that the type of sector does that could help you identify, especially if you end up studying an interruption. And so understanding what their level of delivery and services is before the, the interruption, and then seeing when it comes back and reaches that level again afterwards or something like that, it, it becomes very much a particular context sensitive problem is how to uh, figure out what that might be. You're studying the processes, you can just, you know, like the, the uh, paper in the, the Dorfel et al. 2010 paper in this packet of readings, we just described the processes as resilient processes. Yeah. Um, let, let me, I uh, always so. say that uh, the crisis uh, finishes when, when, when the new star uh, uh, finish to cover it, because yeah. we usually, as a public, we usually don't know the end of the crisis. Media uh, covers the beginning of the crisis, like the 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 most uh, how to say tra tragedy points. But 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 how how communities, how organization actually finish it and it, we we don't know as a public. Well, and it's a challenge too with the studying disaster response and recovery long term. What's the difference between response and actually recovery? And then when do you know when recovery is not the thing, but rather they're back to normal? When, what are those bifurcations? I would argue that when you look at the levels and the progression from individual level, where it's, it's just really a life-saving level, that individual to organization to inter-organization helps better parse out the post-disaster phases at least, because then once you hit the inter-organizational level, what, you, what I've started seeing is that organizations have kind of stabilized in terms of doing their own mission-driven work again. And then they're turning to those inter-organizational networks, especially the nonprofits, to then get, their, get, get more funding. And often in, in the Houston data, my nonprofits often spent money they didn't have confident in their funders that the funders would bring um, the philanthropists in their in their realm would bring in the money and do a little bit more because of the disaster, and um, they were they tended to be right, and so they would go into debt, spending money they didn't have yet, but that structural social capital was in play. It was motivating them, and they were trusting that they could just spend the money and not worry about it. The money will come in eventually, and they did not confirm that. They counted on that social capital that they had. What are the ethical implications of this? I'm trying to, I can't really make sense of a question, but it just seems the, the corporation and bureaucracy, all of this is about furthering the good of the organization and sustaining their goals and us sacrificing to help the organization succeed. And we sort of take it for granted because, you know, sort of on the one hand, we need jobs, but on the other, we need institutions functioning. But it seems like there's really no, very little interest in the stakeholders for this. Yeah, and that's actually, I, I started hinting at that a little bit um, when I talked about even me, myself, not being particular resili particularly resilient at all times during this pandemic, but there's a dark side to resilience too. First of all, think about this. Resilience is anathema to change, if you think about it. You're, you're organizing in a way so that you can perpetuate your organization's delivery of goods and services, right? Right. 
And so it also means during a disaster where people's lives are at stake, you know, the organization is still prevailing. And it's something that's like the OrgCom 101 thing, which is when it's, you know, organizations need individuals to get their work done. But when it comes to the organization's needs versus the individual needs, the organization always prevails, right? And if your needs aren't being met at that organization, they'll invite you to perhaps find a different organization then, right? So now in resilience, the dark side of resilience, and we're seeing this with the social, and, and burnout is a big thing in social um, the social sector, right? In nonprofit organizations that serve the vulnerable, there is a lot of burnout because think about the, 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 the value that you deliver to a community. You help people who are, need, who are in need, in some sort of real dire need too, right? Like there's a really interesting coalition in various cities in the United States called the Coalition for the Homeless. And it's, you know, homeless is prob homelessness is a problem that's a wicked problem, meaning as you try to solve it, it creates new problems. And so it necessarily needs multiple experts to work on it. When you're serving vulnerable like that and you're the worker, and I literally had participants, informants tell me with tears in their eyes, and like, especially one leader, he was on the edge of crying. His chin was quivering when he was telling me about how his employees, while they themselves were getting flooded in their own houses, would still, he found out, they still sent the, the robocall blast to all of their clients. So they were literally employees whose houses were flooding that they were on their phone figuring out how to communicate with the LA robocall center to do the blast to say, okay, we're in shelf safe mode. You won't be getting fresh deliveries until further notice, right? And you know, and he was just quivering because he's like, they were, their lives were in danger and they were still working. Yeah, and you, right? mentioned, you mentioned the pharmaceuticals earlier too, and that just got me. Uh, you know, annoyed as well, because, you know, you take, I don't know which one it is, you know, the efficacy of these, of these vaccines just keeps going down, because we find out they've been fudging the results, and they've been screwing around to try to make them look better, which is exactly what pharmaceuticals have done for 100 years, there's no, yes. nothing surprising here, but we wanted to suspend our trust in, you know, or, or keep our trust and pretend that, you know, that we shouldn't distrust them, even though behind the scenes, they've, they've been doing the same things they always did. And in some ways, you know, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but in some ways, not getting a vaccine and waiting isn't unreasonable given what they're, what they're, what we're getting. And yeah. so there's this. And why isn't, why didn't the government, of course, our government in the United States wasn't sophisticated enough a year ago to demand that, no, the, 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 the corporations need to partner with university centers and do things where universities with IRB and so forth mm -hmm. would, would be far more strict about the efficacy rates, right? Yeah, and there's just that sense, for them it doesn't matter, you know, like they are no risk and they've got a lot of money and, you know, pharmaceuticals could not make a new pill you know, for 10 years and still they're not going out of business. They make so much money from what they do, but we, you're right. I mean, we, we overlook all of this for the, you know, the good of the organization. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a dark side to the resilience, right? So now all of a sudden here, the pandemic becomes this really interesting point, Michael, because the pandemic has been in this interruption where it could have been an opportunity to do things differently and not rely on big pharma. Yet at the same time, our government would it, you know, our government gave money to big pharma and outsourced it to private corporations instead of already trusting that we do have world class universities in this country. Mm -hmm. But the government at the time in 20, you know, 2020 does not trust you, did not trust universities. Yeah. Alvin put his hand up. I don't know if you can see the uh, people. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, I was trying to um, go back to Anna's question about um, how to define resilience and also considering the, uh, the context of pandemic and also along with um, a lot of peeps here uh, who study crisis, a lot of them focusing on corporate crisis. And I think um, if we consider resilience and the corporate crisis, uh, I always consider that the resilience is the ability of corporations to go back to the normal like the, the thing before the crisis happened. 
So there's a baseline and there is a crisis and the ability to go back to the normal. But uh, and although Alvin, there are some uh, there are some frameworks that are actually argue that there's that rebound oriented approach, um, but then there's also the transformative oriented approach where you know learning and intellectual organizations take it and take the crisis as an interruption to the normal resilience processes and transform them so they don't act so they can actually learn and transform as a result of the interruption but anyway so it kind of interact interacts with what i'm thinking about pandemic uh because i feel like pandemic is not only a crisis uh in in terms of you know what we consider a corporate crisis is most if we talk about corporate crisis it's usually uh, mostly focused on one industry or one organization but the pandemic is a crisis for the whole society and there is no normalcy again like there everybody says there will be a new normal so we don't have a a benchmark that will be reinstalled after the pandemic there will be a new one and yeah. And the resilience, like you go back to normal, but how, how you bounce back, like what you are bouncing back to, the normal is never there again. So how can we interpret the, the concept of resilience? Like, because like resilience is like from one state to the other state. The goal, the destination is not there anymore. So well, I guess, how, but that, if you're thinking about it that way, that, that end point, that state, that description of we're going back to delivering our usual mission-driven work and whatnot, um, that is a trait-based approach to resilience, right? And so, but, but when we think about it, really that's more like the outcome of all of this organizing and communicating that happens over time. And in the pandemic, the pandemic is an interesting thing, right? Because I, um, I am starting to see how some some businesses are going to be doing a lot more uh, remote work and getting rid of physical spaces because it's it's good for the bottom line. Now, granted, that doesn't necessarily mean it's good for the the humans that are working for such businesses. I I personally can't wait to commute for an hour a day again. <laughs> But it's it's a it's an important question to ask too. Is this? I think what you're saying is it's the pandemic is not a crisis the way a crisis calm person is going to study it. Certainly, but interestingly, I, I've I've argued that crisis and resilience are kind of two sides of the same coin. It's a crisis that interrupts the organizing processes that I consider resilience processes, right? And, you know, and the crisis can vary, as we talked about in, uh, earlier tonight, the crisis can vary from those one interrupted moments, the corporate scandal, the whatever that impacts only one organization. But we're realizing because these, these such crisis scholars, like think about Seeger or Houston, they study, cri there's crisis comm people who study disasters and organizing processes after disasters. And disasters are different than those one-time events that hit one organization. Disasters are different than an oil spill. An oil spill is disastrous, but it impacts one organization and maybe some local community organizations. A disaster often impacts networks of organizations and communities, right? And so you do, it is important too to recognize that where you are on that continuum may change how you're going to study what you're studying and help you determine when does the story, when is the story arc starting moving through and ending so that you can capture those processes. I don't know if I answered your question. Shima also had a question. Great. Um, speaking of ethics, uh, I'm wondering about the role of activist groups in disasters, uh, which might be missing from the first slide when you were mentioning different uh, organizations or corporations and, that, um, and institutional practices. So one might say that activist groups can be categorized in nonprofit organizations. However, uh, however, I think nonprofit organizations are, are trying to facilitate 
the situation and fill the voids and kind of help the government. However, activist organizations have a controlling role um, monitoring the decisions, for example, that is made by the government um, or to manage the tension between network-based decision-making and formal decisions uh, of the, for example, government. For example, in Australia, um, the, um, uh, as, a response, as a response to the pandemic, to the crisis, um, to the economic crisis caused by the pandemic, the government uh, proposed a gas, gas plan um, to develop uh, gas-fired fossil fuel projects. However, the, active, the environment activists are saying that, no, this is not a kind of um, response that our community is demanding. And we, we want to see um, renewable uh, project, renewable energy project. So I'm wondering about the role of activist groups. In yeah, that's an interesting energy. point, because I think about activist groups in the sense of like corporate social responsibility and the pressures and the and sometimes how that's just window dressing, frankly, CSR efforts and whatnot. But um, I hadn't really thought about the role of activist groups in disaster recovery, per se, um, when it's because I don't I, you might be tapping into something pretty original and unique there. Um, are they, yeah, I, I think about nonprofits that's advocating and working for the vulnerable here in the United States. I don't think of in disaster context of activist organizations per se popping up. However, it, it, it's a, it's a, <laughs> It's it's an interesting quandary, right? I have not thought about it. I don't know the answer to your question, and I think there's an area of research that's ripe for picking there. Um, in the U.S., in when I was interviewing um, a rural towns resilience officer, because in the U.S. now we are through the Federal Emergency Management Administration and that structure and Office of Emergency Management, also seen as OEM in the United States, we have a very vertical structure from the federal government down to the grassroots, in theory, the grassroots level of emergency management. And I was talking with this towns and the, the resilience officer is a bureaucrat, right? And um, was this guy was a former firefighter um, and he might have even been the former fire chief, to be honest. And an interesting conversation came up that I don't have publications about this, but um, but it's certainly worth pushing and pursuing. And it's and it underscores your point about activism because one of the communities um, that one of the neighborhoods in the community that has served he was complaining about them. And in the US, in the Southern US, them is code for uh, black people, um, generally in uh, socioeconomically uh, poor communities. And you know, in the context of this interview with him, he, he kept talking about those people and them and whatnot. And, um, and he said, they don't understand that I have to prioritize getting the lights on for the hospital first. And they're, they're all freaking out because they're the last community to have their lights turned back on. But I'm, I, I've got to prioritize. I've got this decision tree essentially of hospital first, then this, then this. And he you know, goes through the neighborhoods. But of course, at some point, you know, which neighborhoods get their lights on? We, we all can be very skeptical and presume that they have, they're, they're rich, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, getting first. And so this neighborhood um, was, you know, really feeling left out and marginalized even more so than they feel like they are anyway. And there were some activist organizations working for them and I couldn't track them down. I couldn't follow that trail that, you know, that uh, snowball sampling trail because he was kind of coded and wouldn't tell me too much because I think as the interview went on and on I think he realized that he was talking himself into a, a political controversy frankly and um 
And so, yeah, so I was not able to figure it out. I don't know that region well enough, but you might be in a region where you can study that in a hyper local level and really start understanding those tensions. And what was so frustrating is this, here's this resilience officer and he's actually not building inter he's not building partnerships with the local communities. So let's say with that community, for example, they're not going to have their lights turned on as quickly as the hospital's neighborhood is going to. Let's say that's, and that's going to be the way it goes, but they don't, he didn't do anything to build a dialogic relationship with them and engage them in a moral and ethical conversation about how do we best serve you, re recognizing these other tensions that we have when disaster strikes. And I think that's, that's, I, I, Think Shima that you've got a, a really unique and I and I pause for a minute there because I can't think of any literature right now that I've read that gets into activist organizations, but I'll certainly look for it. There you go, paper idea. I just wanted to comment a little bit on that from a different point of view because it's kind of all touching on my dissertation. I've read that some activists, you know, like uh, in Mexico, there were some um, feminism activists. And actually, when the crisis struck, they went and kind of went to help the community. And that way, they were building their identity. By the way, what you're studying, right? Kind of their legitimacy in the community for their rights, kind of for the idea, even though they didn't talk about the feminism when they were helping with a disaster. Right. But they were definitely carrying this idea because they were helping people. Same thing was happening with some green activists. Again, yeah. when the pandemic hit, they kind of changed from being green to, not, not like change from being green, but they had this new function of helping people with food and kind of, you know, like all those kind of things. So I definitely think, Suma, like, you know, yeah. some would think so. I definitely yeah, but, but it's the same country. thing with faith-based groups, right? Faith-based groups yeah. are very commonly, groups of them go and descend on a community and do the do the mucking out of houses and that sort of thing. And they don't proselytize, but they they do eventually believe that their, you know, that their workers being there and being a presence is a form of proselytizing. One note I wanted to ask if 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 kind of what you're thinking because right now we're talking about resilience as something that existed kind of um, not perceived by the people. Like you, we're talking about resilience as it is, kind of disconnected from the people. So as soon as the process moving, it's moving, it's resilient, but it's not like the perception of the people. What for the resilience is happening, what, what they perceive it's resilient and how this affects their people, how it kind of, how, how it connects better to the people. Uh, this kind of what I'm trying to build in terms of the engagement, kind of going, getting, going yeah. back to the people and going back to the perception of the people, kind of wanted to hear from you what you think about this, kind of the idea of what for it happening and whether there are, where we can find like different types of resilience based on that or like, you know, different, different ways the process are happening. Well, there are certainly levels of resilience, right? The individual level. When I look at it, I ask people, what do you think of, organ what is organizational resilience? And it really, your, your question, Anna, uh, very nicely taps back to Michael's initial question about the um, ethics about this, is often the answer to that question is my ability to just not worry about what's going on in my life right now, because they're talking about organizational resilience. And to carry out, I wish I knew where I had this um, this quote. I, 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 it would be great if I can find this exact quote. Give me a second while I'm um, doing a quick keyword search. Um, oh, I, I'm not going to find it. So anyway, so she says something, I'll paraphrase something like, resilience to me is pushing all of that other stuff to the side and not worrying about it. And getting getting up every day and getting that stuff done that I need to get done, um, and and notice in that answer she's not in, at an individual level she's not resilient but she's she's perpetuating the organizational resilience and she's ignoring her exhaustion. This particular person is was a leader of a, a CERT team in the U.S. A CERT team is essentially a Red Cross trained group of people that have learned some of the basics of, you know, they, they're they they're the real first responders since 
Um, official response often takes 72 hours roughly to mobilize. You know, there might be firefighters and police, but um, CERT is also community citizen response groups. And, um, and she said that she, uh, she didn't, pretty much for the first three or four days, she got one or two hours of sleep a night. So I, you know, I don't know if that answers your question, Anna, but the different levels of resilience, it does matter. And there's, there are entire um, literatures on each level of resilience, like a, a go-to that I would suggest at the individual level is an author named, I don't know the author's first name, but Bonanno, B-O-N-N-A-N-O. Um, and, and at each of those levels, we can talk about what resilience means at each of those levels. Okay, I just sent a message saying that uh, you're getting over being sick. We should probably wrap this up so you can get some rest. Did anybody want to ask any other questions here? As we, and if not, we'll let you do a wrap up and move on. I have a potentially quick one. Um, and thank you, thank you for joining today. It's really insightful and really informative. Thank you. Um, so I'm coming from a background at the University of Missouri, where um, Dr. Houston is actually a co-chair for my dissertation. And oh. so I'm branching from a history in um, I'm from past backgrounds in like message strategy, message manipulation, content. And now I'm getting into new territory of organizational learning where it's not just communicative, like the implications are going to be extending into actual things like you mentioned partnerships and how do you get organizations to kind of buy into that investment because it's not just statements, not just an apology, but it's actually showing that like, you know, maybe you have to revisit hiring port protocols or addressing weaknesses or system vulnerabilities that it's going to cost money. Is there any advice for how to handle that? And that's the thing, right, is all this stuff costs money and building capacity costs money because it means you need more employees. You know, it means that the boss maybe isn't going on, you know, leaving work as early because maybe it's, the, it, it, especially for smaller companies, um, if we're talking about for-profit companies and entrepreneurial companies, like in the U.S., small businesses are considered businesses that have fewer than 500 employees. Um, so often in such small businesses, um, and they can be down to like a couple of entrepreneurs own a business, it's the three of them. Do they have time to do that? Are they sophisticated in thinking about that? When the small business administration resources tell them, make sure your business partners know, they don't, you know, that's it. That's all they have. The communication and the training on that is really actually pretty um, anemic. And so how do you do that? It's, you know, through... I find that students, especially my graduate students in the terminal master's program, when I teach these concepts in that class, I do get a lot of middle management. I get a lot of um, business entrepreneurs because we live in, I, I, I work in Rutgers, which is right next to New York City and Philadelphia. So we get a lot of professionals that are continuing their education at night and they eat this stuff up and it helps them really think more, more thoroughly about these issues. Right. And I've seen like, um, is it, is Winnie's uh, program, the Our House School, is that where she is? She's in the business school. They've done many MBAs and, um, uh, you know, in their MBA training, they're talking more and more in the management world too. They're talking more and more about building social capital and they think about it that way and so think about this too erica is social capital i mean going back to michael's question again about ethics i hate the term social capital because it treats relationships as something that we can invest in and get something out of instead of just having a humanitarian you know a human orientation towards these relationships but social capital is the language now and it's very hard to try to change it. And I've, trust me, I've tried and, and then no one's taking it up, <laughs> but you know, but those are, those are, you know, in the parlance of social capital, you can start training and educating and doing those interruptions. But if you wanted to do some training and do some, uh, you know, control groups and compare that, that could be a really cool dissertation topic. Okay, why don't we uh, wrap it up and, and call it a day? Yeah, wow, I was, uh, thank you guys so much. What a treat and what, I feel so spoiled that you 
all stayed engaged for this whole time. I'm really uh, humbled by it. I really appreciate your audience and that you're so engaged in these questions that we had such a nice, interesting discussion afterwards as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Cheers, time. everyone. Take Bye. Care. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 All right, Maria. Good job. Thank I you. learned a lot. Great. Yeah.